Okay. So, uh, welcome. I guess you can introduce yourself. I can, yes. <laughs> can, can you all hear me or shall I use a microphone? If that's a problem, you, you in the back of the room, just raise your finger just or something like that. Yeah. yeah, good? So. All right, I'll speak like this and then any problems I'll get the microphone. Um, so my name's Katie McCrory. Um, I don't have any slides, I just have some notes. So um, let's see how that goes. But uh, thank you very much for having me. I moved to Copenhagen last summer. Uh, so I'm delighted that I don't have to do this in Danish because that would have been a, a living nightmare for me. Um, but uh, I'm currently the uh, senior global communications lead for a for-profit company called Sustainia, which works in, as the name would imply, the sustainability sector. Um, it's a for-profit company. Uh, people often think it's an NGO. I think there's often this sense that um, organizations like mine, which have a very kind of startup mentality, which look at uh, really kind of promoting a positive narrative about sustainability, identifying solutions and opportunities. People often think it's a charity or an NGO, but uh, we're very clear actually, it's a, it's a for-profit. Um, and I will talk more about that in a bit. Um, what I thought would be more interesting is to talk about my Copenhagen story, why I'm here. Um, because why? I, that's the first question everyone asks me whenever I meet someone new. Why, why did you move to Copenhagen? Why are you in Denmark? And I love hearing about people's relocation stories. I loved hearing about your relocation story. Um, because it often involves things that we don't have that much control over, like who we fall in love with, where our jobs take us, where our studies might take us. Um, and uh, it's often I, I find when you talk about people's relocation stories, there, there are these sort of strokes of fate or chance encounters that happen. And my story is very different um, because I don't have a Danish partner, which is usually what most people assume. I'm here because you know I'm a sexual refugee, is what they call it. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm married, but he's British. Um, I didn't move for work. So I was a freelancer when I moved here, and I didn't come to study either. So I have a, a slightly different story. I moved here because I had a very purposeful reason to do so. Um, I, I did it by design, and that's what I want to talk to you about today, about living by design. Um, so when I moved to Denmark, all of my friends were like, oh, it's like the happiest nation on the planet, right? They're all just super happy all the time. Um, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to find out if that's true, and if so, why, why is that the case? Um, and it, it certainly has this incredible progressive uh, society, and particularly around equality, and that was something that was really important for me. Um, and when you look at it in comparison to Britain, in particular, when you look at Copenhagen in comparison to London, there is a world of difference. But the, the fundamental thing about Denmark is that it didn't do that accidentally. It did it by design. Um, and I think design, when we talk about design, it, it's often conflated with style. So it's about you know the table design or the clothes we wear. Um, but actually, good design is about being creative, and it's about leaving something better than you found it. That, for me, is about good design. That's designing for good. And that could be a teapot, or it could be a bicycle lane. That's all good design. And I think if you uh, lead a design-led approach to life, then you can create a much more empathetic, individual, fair and sustainable solution for, for home and for work. <coughs> and that's a very compelling prospect and it was something it took me a long time to get to. Uh, it's actually it's not a radical or particularly original point of view, so the idea of design thinking in a formal sense has, has been around the block for decades and you may have heard of organisations like IDEO who really uh, sort of, uh, I guess, branded this idea of human centered design um, and I'd actually been using sort of later in my uh, in my work design thinking with some organizations that I was working with so I would use design thinking to help charities devise fundraising strategies for example and I'd been doing this to some success just start with something anything to start and get it going get that train moving and then you start testing, you go out into the world and you start working out, okay, is this, how does this feel? How does this kind of work suit me? How does this lifestyle suit me? And you'll make mistakes and you'll get it horribly wrong sometimes, as I have along the way, but, uh, but that's how you learn. And you fail, but you fail fast. So the question you may have is, what the hell has design thinking got to do with sustainability? Um, and I think it has everything to do with purpose. 
and how you get from where you are to where you want to be. And uh, Charles Eames, who's the very iconic designer, you probably have heard of his name in relation to the iconic um, Eames chairs. He had a great line, and I'm going to steal it. He says, design is a plan for arranging elements in such a way as best to accomplish a particular purpose. And I think that totally nails it. That is exactly what design is. It's getting from A to B in the most effective, compelling way possible so you can achieve your purpose. And the thing about purpose is once you know the kind of person that you want to be and you know the kind of work that you want to do and the kind of world that you want to live in, it actually becomes fundamentally impossible to do a job that doesn't allow you to fulfill that. Because you will go crazy. And that's, I think, consistently what's happened to me. I have always had a very clear sense of what my purpose is. And if I'm not able to fulfill that in the work that I'm doing, then I move. I'm a little like the people you were talking about, the two years of, right? <laughs> okay, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done here, I'm going to move on. Um, and in the sustainability sector, there's a lot of talk about purpose, and it's a very, uh, a very subjective term. Um, and when we talk about purpose-led companies, I think that misses the point entirely. Because companies don't have purpose, people have purpose. And that's what gives a company direction, it's the people that work there. So I currently, as I said, I work for a company called Sustainia, um, which is very proud to talk about the work that it does in sustainability. We look at sort of shortening the gap between systemic risk and opportunity. And we do that primarily for businesses, but we also do it for NGOs and governments as well. Um, and they're very proud, they, you know, they do it very effectively. The reason I joined was not actually because of the work they do, although I find that work totally fascinating and compelling. Um, but it's because I'm allowed to bring my values into work every day, into the office. I can live out my purpose and I can help create the world that I want to live in. And those are exactly the same as the values I had 10 years ago when I started out working. So on the face of it, my CV is like a hot mess, like it doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but there is a red thread that connects everything and it's, it's those values. So I have started off uh, working in the arts, I was a theatre promoter um, for uh, comedians at the Edinburgh Festival, uh, and I've meandered my way from that through media relations and uh, public affairs and business model innovation, and I've worked for tiny, tiny charities that have one <coughs> full-time member of staff, but an absolute conviction to change the world, to massive, massive humanitarian aid agencies. I've worked for small startups that are nimble and haven't really got any money and are bootstrapping every day, to big, faceless corporates that are these massive juggernauts. And it's been fascinating, because I've always gravitated towards where, uh, where the where I'm allowed to fulfill my values, but where I can actually add value as well. Where's the difference that I can make? Um, and I think, ultimately, what I've gravitated towards is, is storytelling. And that's where I sort of find myself in the sustainability sector and in communications, because I'm really passionate about helping tell that story of the world that we want to live in. Um, yeah. So I know it's really hard uh, when you don't have a handle on what you want to do with your life. And, uh, and I certainly experienced that when I moved to Copenhagen. So I moved here, as I said, my Copenhagen story, why did I come here? Well, I came here because uh, Copenhagen represented something that was very close to my values. It was about social equality. It was about uh, living in and working in an environment that really matched the world I wanted to live in. I think Copenhagen demonstrates on a daily basis how we can do things much better. Uh, and I wanted to be kind of in that intoxicating environment. Um, but when I moved here, I was, a, I was a freelancer. So I know how frustrating it is when you don't know what you're doing. And that people keep saying, why are you here and what do you do? And there's also this very maddening Danish mentality of this desperate need to always ask, what do you do? What do do? It's like the first thing you learn in, in, in Danish school was, you know, where do I work? What do I do? What do you do? What do you do for work? I don't know, it's very complicated. Um, so I, I get how, you know, how frustrating and hard it is to have that story about what you actually do. So I only have one piece of advice, and a bit like Scott, I'm, you know, I don't really have careers advice. Um, don't listen to me. But it is important, yes, to follow the jobs pages and to, to network and to you know, get out there and be busy and, and uh, just be active. Um, but it is just as important to take the time to really get to the heart of who you are. Start with empathy, because if you start with empathy about yourself, 
then you can use design to fulfill your purpose. And I think if you can connect those dots about the values that you have at home and the way you want to work, it means that, you know, as you navigate the jobs market here in, uh, in Copenhagen or in Denmark, and you think about the next steps in your career, um, and so the next time someone asks you, you know, do, what do you do? Uh, you don't have to worry about what you can say, because you can say to them very proudly that you are simply living your life with purpose. one because they say everything and nothing so when people say what do you do at Sustainia and I go well I'm the you know senior global communications lead I literally don't know what that means so job titles is one thing what you actually get to do day to day that's that's the good stuff and I uh, I think again to um, uh, Scott's point there is a really um, compelling uh, sort of motivation I think particularly for younger people to try out lots of things and find out a, what they like, but B, what kind of leader they want to be. So I've, uh, I've always gravitated towards storytelling, but that doesn't always have to be in the communication sector, because you can be a storyteller anywhere in the business, in the same way that you can be an entrepreneur and work within an organization, and you can be a leader if you're cleaning floors as well as if you're making decisions at the C-suite. So storytelling is the, is the thing that's been consistent for me, but how I actually execute that has been quite different. So probably the most radical ends of what I've done is uh, you know, doing uh, PR, public relations, for um, you know, I don't know, massive blockbuster exhibitions at the British Museum is an example of one of the jobs that I had, one of the roles that I had, all the way through to doing business model innovation for uh, Virgin um, on their sort of mobile sector. So those are two completely different things that like have almost no connections. But it, it, at every single point, I guess I've been a storyteller. Yeah. It's about how do you persuade people to do stuff, essentially. Yeah, but how do you convince them that you are better than those who are majored there and those who have built their past for 10 years experience? How do you convince them that you're better than them? Because you Detach everything. Yeah. Yeah. How, how do you get your job? You know? I think it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's like total imposter syndrome. Like, Why are you here? Um, how do I get my job? It's a story you tell about yourself. So I, people often reflect on my CV, and and there are, there's always one of two reactions. They go, bloody hell, you've done a lot of jobs in not a huge amount of time. Why is that? Or well, they go, bloody hell, that's really interesting, you've had a bunch of jobs. So it's either curiosity or kind of complete, oh, I get it. And I think, you know, again, uh, you are the master of your own career, and you are the only person who can tell your story. No one else can do that for you. And I, I have a good story, I think, for why I've done what I've done. And when I meet people, it's, you connect on the things that you're interested in, you connect on values, you connect on the value you can bring. And it doesn't necessarily matter. Look, I'm not going to be a brain surgeon. Uh, you know, that would require me to have some, you know, quite specific qualifications that I definitely lack. But I think when it comes to the sort of the knowledge economy, which is really what we operate in, which is about trading insights <coughs> and research and motivation and aspiration and stories, then I think it's all up for grabs. I think it's for you to say, I can do that. You know, give me a chance. Why not? If you believe in yourself, then, you know, you would, uh, you would hope they believe in you too. So I, yeah, I don't, I haven't, it's not, um, I've not had anyone really say to me, look, I don't think you've had enough experience on this to do it. I think most people have gone, go on, give it a shot, and I've sort of gone for it, really. Yes, what exactly do you do at Sustainia? That's a good question. Um, so I, in practical day-to-day -day terms, I run the press office. So I orchestrate uh, all of our media relations activity um, and I do sort of strategic communication. So I think in a more sort of holistic view about the stories we want to tell about the work we do, who we want to tell them to and when we're going to say it. And that involves sort of creating action plans and content plans and so on. I do a lot of writing. So I, I, uh, 
either for blogs that we produce or um, I write for a few outlets like The Guardian um, and Collectively, which is a sustainability website. Um, if you guys are interested in sustainability, you should look at it. Um, so I do bits and pieces like that as well. That's sort of my day-to-day. Um, but really, I'm there to, I guess, help the organization find its voice and then, and then tell its stories. So that's, yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about what what is the work at Sustainia, what uh, this company uh, does? What it does. So Sustainia was founded about five years ago. Um, it, it sits within a, an organization called Monday Morning, which is a, an innovation house. Uh, it's been around for about 25 years. Uh, it has a very, Monday Morning, or Monday Morning has a very uh, Nordic facing remit. So it works within um, sort of Scandinavia. And five years ago, uh, an incredibly um, compelling young woman uh, called Laura Storm approached the founder and said, you know, I think there's, we're missing a trick when it comes to sustainability. I think the stories we tell are quite depressing. It's about doom and gloom. It's about the world we don't want to live in rather than the one we do. Um, and I think it's putting people off. You know, we're not helping people get behind the sustainability agenda. Why don't we create an organization that can do that differently? So when she founded it, uh, it had two remits. One was to shift the narrative about sustainability, turn it into a positive um, scenario. And the second was to help identify the very practical solutions from all over the world that would help create this sort of the world of tomorrow. And uh, I think it's had a huge amount of traction. I think what's been fascinating is how many other players have moved into the space since Sustainia sort of went out with that remit. And now we're not alone in being an organization that does that. So we're going through a bit of a, I guess, an evolution to determine, OK, well, what do we do next? Like, maybe that part of the battle is we're sort of warmed away now. There's a lot of momentum behind it. There's a lot of other organizations helping us tell this positive story and get solutions out there. We're not the only ones. So what can we do? So now we're really looking at uh, how the global goals, the sustainable development goals, how they might present business opportunities. And we're helping really reframe that for, for organizations of various sizes, but helping them innovate with a view to really identifying market opportunities around the SDGs. So it's slightly, it's not different, but it's, a, it's an evolution, I guess, from where it was um, five years ago. Yeah? I have a question. Uh, what did you learn about the Probably not that relevant. I studied history. Oh, okay. So, you know, <laughs> that's like, um, yeah. But I, it's interesting because having moved to uh, Denmark, uh, I've noticed that uh, people tend to stay in education longer um, and will do, often do a bachelor's and then a master's and then maybe do a, you know, MBA. And um, I think there's lots of good reasons for that. You know, it's really affordable to study here to the extent you practically get paid to do it. Um, and that's very different in the UK. The UK education landscape is really different. So most people graduate, they do a, a BA, and at 21 they get out and they get into the jobs market. And that's pretty much my story. I graduated, I did, I did technically did a master's in history, graduated at 22, and was like, I have no money, so I have to start, <laughs> start working, because the government's not going to give me anything. Um, but, I, but I think, I mean, history, I've always said it's that actually it's very relevant because it's about how you process information, it's how you package up arguments, it's got a lot of analysis in it, and it is essentially, you're telling stories, I mean, you're retelling, you know, history in, in, a, in a compelling way, so I think actually there's a lot of skill, trans like soft skill transfers, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a single qualification in communications or sustainability or business innovation. Like I don't have formal learning in that. I think I've always, I've just always learned on the job. And I think my experience and some of the best people I've ever worked with have often followed a very similar trajectory. They just learn on the job. <coughs> I think it makes you a lot sharper at it, perhaps. Than Sorry, say that again. Did they, did they ask you about the Danish language? About did, did they ask me about my Danish language? No. And actually, the so I one of the reasons we chose Copenhagen was because I knew that uh, English was a working language for a number of organisations. So, you know, I moved here for lots of social 
minded reasons about the kind of life I wanted to live and how I might want to raise a family. But I was also very acutely aware that from a professional perspective, I would be able to find the level of jobs that I felt I wanted and deserved because language wouldn't be a problem. But I've heard, I think I saw a really interesting stat. They said that over half of the jobs advertised from the for-profit sector uh, require native English language speakers. So there's a huge shift, I think, in, in English being a formal working language for local organisations. So I don't speak well, well, I do, I mean, I'm learning. Um, but I'm appalling. I'm not the only English speaker in the office. There's an American woman, so I feel a bit better. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's not, it's not been a problem professionally so far. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of project do you, uh, do you deal with? Uh, in uh, I think one of the most persuasive things you can do from a storytelling perspective is find the things that people are already talking about and then add you know, into that debate something, inject something new and different rather than just try and create a new conversation over here. So we've looked at what's happening in the world and we've thought about, well, how could we contribute something different to big global movements or moments that are happening? <coughs> so a really good example is uh, when it was International Women's Day, and there was a lot of activity, and I said, I think we have a great chance here to talk about uh, gender equality and sustainability, because they, the two are intrinsically connected. Uh, and, and it didn't feel that there was a huge amount of, of sort of I guess there weren't that many conversations taking place that really addressed that. So my project, as I defined it, was to create a series of um, sort of talking points and uh, blogs, and we pitched, like you know, set press releases out, and we pitched um, article ideas to lots of different journalists and platforms. And uh, over the course of the week of International Women's Day, we had all these lovely bits of sort of coverage um, coming out that allowed us to share our opinions about the interconnectivity of gender equality and sustainability. So that's a sort of a very distinct project. And then when that came to an end, we looked at it and said, how did that do? You know, what kind of traction did we get? How much online engagement did we get? And we saw it spike massively. So we're like, well, that sounds like that's, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Let's do that again. So now we do one a month and we pick different themes. Um, so the next big one we're going to do is the Olympics. So we're going to talk about um, sustainability and sustainable market opportunities around the Olympics, which I'm really excited about. So we can do like the sustainability medal table and stuff, it's going to be great. Um, and I've got a really good design team as well, um, who are very creative. So every time we, I come up with story ideas, they can visually help me pull together something that also looks really good as well. So, yeah, so that's an example of a, of a project. Can you ask about uh, your customers? Our customers, um, wow. yeah, well, um, I mean, predominantly uh, sort of multinational businesses is, is who we're seeking to work with. So we think, so one of our big customers at the moment is um, the United Nations Global Compact, and they have a remit to help really reframe the way that businesses engage around sustainability. Um, that's been their remit for 15 years. Um, and they've just appointed a new executive director, a Dane, Lizzie Kingo. Um, which is fantastic uh, for Danish companies who want to get more traction in places like New York to have fantastic Danish leaders in organisations there. Um, so the kinds of businesses that they work with are, you know, big, big multinationals. Uh, you know, you're talking about massive global supply chains. Uh, yeah, I mean, Northern Nordisk is a great example of one. Um, so those are the kinds of customers we're looking to work with increasingly. The big businesses where you can really start to see the you know the needle turn on sustainability because when when big organisations make decisions, I think the shift is so much greater potentially. And uh, may I ask another question? Yeah. About your challenges. My challenges. Yes. Your. My personal uh, challenges. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, company. Challenges. Oh, the company challenges. Uh, well, I think so. From a sort of competition perspective, you know, we're we're a business and we have to pay people salaries, so. You know, we have a bottom line that we have to meet, and that's that's hard. That's hard to do. It's a very competitive landscape. You know, as I said five years ago, I think what we were doing felt uh, a lot more original and unique, and now it doesn't. So you have to be agile. You have to pivot. You have to be prepared to move and evolve and and understand where the where the market <coughs> is. 
So our biggest <coughs> challenge is really identifying what are people prepared to pay us to do, actually? What do they want? What are, you know, where can we add that value? What are they prepared to pay for? So that's a, that's a, that's a really big challenge. I think from a communications perspective, um, the challenge is, is really uh, uh, having genuine insight-led storytelling. So really digging deep on what is it we know that other people don't know. And that requires really rigorous research, it requires really fantastic analysis, you know, it requires time and money and conviction to really create that. So we're not just going out and telling a story that anyone else could tell. So it's sort of finding that point of difference. So I think those are probably the two biggest challenges that we face as an organisation. But, you know, it's not a challenge, it's an opportunity. Um, and it makes the job more interesting, I think. And, uh, another question, maybe? Excuse, excuse me, I mean, you've asked yeah. a lot. I mean, <laughs> okay. maybe we should have, because we have time for one more question. Yes. Maybe it's the same question you would yes. have asked. Yes, sure. yes. So, anyone else? Now you don't dare because you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, then you can ask a question. What about it? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, before joining to the company, uh, you, uh, you guess uh, uh, your uh, qualification match the uh, purpose of company strategies and so on. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, is it true now? Yes, when like the, yeah. Look at them. Yeah, I think so. I think I mean, um, I think I was probably a very natural fit for this kind of job. I had worked consistently in communications in different ways. Um, and I have always gravitated towards the broadest definition of sustainability. Um, so I think, yeah, it, uh, it, I, didn't, um, I didn't feel like I was a wild card candidate for the job. I felt like I was a very natural fit, actually, for this one. So, yeah, is that? Yeah. That Thank you. Okay. We're going to have a break in a short moment. I, I just wanted to say uh, it was super inspiring to hear about, and we're lucky that we have it on video. And uh, if you're not pulling off, I mean, we, we're still going to yeah. publish it. And we're going to share it with you. So uh, when you've uh, signed up for this event, we have snatched your email address, and we allow ourselves to send you an email afterwards. And you can always unsubscribe. We don't spam anyone. But we're going to send these videos so you can see them again. And I think there were some very, very interesting uh, things about design that I would like to apply to my career guidance. Because mm -hmm. you said you don't have any career advice. This is career <laughs> advice. And, mm -hmm. and also Scott's point that follow your instincts. I mean, find out what you want. This is all about career guidance, basically. Right? Yep. And designing your own thing. I mean, that's really inspiring. So we're going to have it. I hope the sound will be good. Quick question. Yeah. How many jobs did you apply for when you moved to Copenhagen? Uh, none, actually. None. Yeah, and um, I think, I mean, I, we can talk about it over coffee maybe, but um, yeah. I think, uh, I, I, yeah, I, every, I think the majority of jobs that I've got have come out of being in conversation with people. So I don't, it's rare that I've kind of gone to a job <coughs> I've seen advertised and gone, I want that one. I think actually the best kind of career opportunities come from, you know, building up relationships with people and then kind of being in the right place at the right time, which is exactly how this job happened. So I'd been having a conversation with them for months, months and months and months. And I knew about them before I moved to Copenhagen because I'd been involved a little bit with them. So I wasn't a completely random, cold contact. I, you know, so I guess the bottom line is networking. And this is also an opportunity to network. So now we're going to have a short coffee break. And uh, afterwards, we're going to hear from Frédéric, who's here, and Camille, who is there. So have a cup of coffee, and then we'll get...